Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Redeemer Church. As always, it's an awesome day, any day that we can worship the Lord. So, if you can, pray with us. Thank you, Lord, because you're here with us. Let us be here for you, not only physically, but mentally and spiritually, because we need you, God. We need you to fuel us with the grace and the love that only you can give. In your name we pray. Amen. Search my heart and search my soul. There's nothing else that I want more. Shine your light and show your face. In my life, Lord, have your
unbelievable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the skies and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. Incomparable, unchangeable. You see the depths of my heart and you love me. being here is not enough. I know that singing is not enough. I know that our whole lives are not enough to pay for everything you've done for us. So have mercy on us. And let this time that we're here just be a little time where we can be closer to you. And at least we may become a little bit more of what you want. To you we live. And to you is all the glory. Uh, church, good morning to you uh, and welcome in. For those who are watching online, welcome and we're glad that you're with us today. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me please to Acts chapter 11. If you want to hold the Bible in your hands, uh, the blue ones there in the pews are the ones in English. Uh, Acts chapter 11, I'll give you a moment to turn there. We'll be reading uh, verses 19 to 26. And today we kind of wrap up our time in Acts as we head into kickoff weekend and then uh, we'll jump into Exodus on the other side. Uh, if you could stand with me, please, as we always do, as a show of respect to God's word. Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 19, word of God. 
Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Let's pray, church. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of worship and the gift of your word. And now, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work through this text, through this imperfect instrument, that we might hear your voice this morning. Speak to us, God, loud and clear what you want your people to hear this morning. We thank you for the very great privilege of gathering in your presence, of being able to hold your word in our hands and hear it in our ears. And I pray, God, that all of our minds and hearts now would be just focused on you. So, Heavenly Father, would you be glorified today? Jesus, would you be glorified today? And Holy Spirit, move in this place, change it. May it be the dwelling place of God Almighty for the moments that we're here, gathered in his presence. So, Father, speak to us. Your children are listening and we are here. We love you and we thank you for Christ who makes us more impossible. In his precious name we all pray. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. <clears throat> so as I, as I mentioned a moment ago, church, we bring uh, Acts to a close today. I hope you've enjoyed our journey. We've been in it basically since Mother's Day, really Father's Day. Once June kicked in, we've been walking you through the book of Acts. And this is, since we're kind of building up to today and we wrap it up today, I want to present it to you in this fashion. Um, one of my favorite things as a child was the space program. I was a child of the Kennedy Space Center. When mom and dad would give me the option of Disney or Kennedy, I would want to go to the Space Center and just look at the rockets again. Uh, as some of you might have done when you were younger and things were a lot safer in our country, um, one of those tour buses actually took us into that gigantic hangar. I don't know if you ever had that privilege, and that was something that was just awe-inspiring. And then uh, at that time, the space shuttles were beginning their journeys into space, and we had the chance, again, to be pulled up nice and close uh, to one of them. I believe it was the Challenger uh, when I was a, as a kid. And it was on top of that gigantic moving platform that moves like a mile a day or something, because of, of course, because of the weight upon it. And I always enjoyed, and you've probably done this as well, when you're watching the countdown on TV, right, there's the rumble, and there's the coming off of the fog and the gases and whatnot, and then there's the glow, and then there's the, 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 the smoke that comes out. And that's what's been happening all of these weeks, just so you understand, right, because everything has been building on top of what Christ said. Alex walked us through this back in June. One of Jesus' last words to his disciples as he's about to ascend is not only what we see in Matthew, uh, go, make, teach, and baptize, but it's also, you will be my witnesses, he says, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So we've already done some of that already at this point. Uh, and with this, we slowly start to slide into our first point. He, here's, look at the trajectory. Look at, look at the movement from the hangar out to the launch pad. There has been Pentecost, and there has been Peter preaching after he betrayed Christ, and there were 3,000 that started, and they're meeting in the temple courts, and there's been a miracle of a crippled man, and then there's been warnings and floggings by the Sanhedrin, and there has been a giving, Barnabas giving a house. He sold his house. How radical is that, church? Think, think about how you could be a radical giver like him. He sold his house and gave it to the apostles so that they would bless the poor. And then you have Stephen, the first of the deacons, because the church is too big now. We can't handle all these people. And so you have Stephen, who's an outspoken college student. He gets himself in trouble. He gets in the face of the Sanhedrin. Saul is there now. He's on the scene, right? Here is the hunter that has shown up. 
and they don't like what he says, and they drag him out to the edge of town, and they kill this young man, and everybody rips off his clothes and gives it to Saul, and then the hunter is going to Damascus, and there's lights, and there's voices from the sky, right? And then all of a sudden, he's converted. In the span of three days, this man was blind, and now he sees, and he's already preaching, There in Damascus. And then he comes down to Jerusalem. They're scared of him. This was last week. And they're scared of him. And they try to kill him there too. And now he's off to Tarsus. And this has been coming from the hangar, crawling very slowly to the launch pad. And now the rocket is sitting there and it's simmering. And there's gas coming off of it. And the glow is happening. And the smoke is starting to come out. And now we've arrived at the place where it's going to launch. Unfortunately, we're just going to see the beginning of it. We're going to pick this up on the other side, the kind of next summer when we see the missionary journeys. But nonetheless, the picture of what we've been doing for you has been that kind of movement. And now we've arrived at the place where the words of Christ are beginning to be fulfilled. How has that happened? Acts chapter 1-8, I'll just read it to you. Jesus says to his disciples, right as he's ascending, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem Mega church, apostles, the thousands, right, broken up by the persecution. And in all of Judea, that's the southern part, that's kind of where they were. And Samaria, let's say something about that for a second because we skipped over Philip and we skipped over Peter because we've been following Saul so closely. Philip was one of those college students along with Stephen. He was like his number two man there when they're serving the widows in the church. And Philip was also outspoken. And here's something that the, the Jerusalem church, the apostles never even thought of for a second. Philip, this young guy in the end, goes off to Samaria. Let me remind you about the Samaritans. They were the half-breeds. They were the ones that the good religious Jews in the south did not love because when Israel was conquered and she was destroyed, they mixed with the people that the Assyrian Empire Empire brought in. So there's mixed blood, there's mixed religion. It's a mess, and they're just hated. And Philip, of all things, takes Jesus to them. And all of a sudden, when he preaches Jesus to the half-breeds, to the ones that we hate, Guess what happens? The Holy Spirit comes on them and they give their life to Jesus and now you have a problem on your hands because it's not just for us anymore coming out of the synagogue. Now it's the half breeds, but then it gets worse because we also skipped over the next step here near Samaria. We skipped over Peter, Cornelius, a a, a Gentile, a Roman. He's praying one day. He's a God-fearer. In other words, God-fearer was a term used for Gentiles who kind of sat in the back of the synagogue. They liked the Jewish faith. They were learning about it. And he sees a vision, and the vision says to go, uh, to go get Peter. And probably you remember this because we preached it a couple of times. Peter's praying, right? And a blanket gets brought down from the sky. Do you remember that? Blanket from the sky. There's a bunch of weird animals. And Peter's like, and, and the voice says, kill and eat. He says, oh, I can't touch unclean thing. What does God say? What I have made clean, you can't call unclean. And there's a knock at the door. And now Peter, of all things, goes into the house of a Gentile. He brings the gospel into the house, and all the Gentiles... Say yes to Jesus. So now we really have a problem on our hands. Because again, it's not only just kind of pure Jews coming out of the synagogue. Now it's the half-breeds and now it's the kind of on the edge Gentile people. And now the words of Christ are beginning to be fulfilled. But there's one piece missing. The ends of the earth. And now what you find here in Antioch. Notice that, they, notice that Luke kind of comes back. If you, if you would have followed along with, with Acts. Last week we were in chapter 9. Chapter 10 and 11 are dedicated to those two encounters that I told you about right now. And then we arrive here at the end of 11, at the very end. Because of Stephen, because of his death, people were scattered. And all of a sudden now, some came to speak to only Jews. That's what it says in verse 19. But then in verse 20, some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene. I think we have a map. We'll show it to you. A map of Cyprus and Cyrene, how they came to Antioch, began to speak to Greeks also. So now there is a shift. Now there's a shift that is happening where all of a sudden it's not, it's not just pure Jews out of the synagogue. That was always step one. It's not the Samaritans, one foot in, one foot out of the culture. It's not people like Cornelius that had kind of one foot in the Gentile world, but they were interested in the Jewish religion, so to speak. But now all of a sudden you're talking to people who do not know Abraham. They do not know Moses. They do not know anything about the slavery in Egypt. They don't know anything about Mount Sinai. They don't know anything about the wilderness. They don't know anything about a pillar of fire or a tabernacle. They know nothing of Joshua. They know nothing of a promised land. They do not know King Saul. They do not know King David. They don't know King Solomon. They don't know any of it. These people are just sitting there, and they have come out of a Roman worldview, and now they're meeting Jesus. And guess what? They're saying yes, but it gets better. Because the people who came from Cyprus and Cyrene, guess what? There are no big names here. 
There's not a Stephen and there's not a Saul Paul. There is not Peter. There's not a Philip. There's not even a Barnabas. We do not know who these people are. They were people who were scattered from the persecution. They end up in Cyrene, which is over in Africa. They end up in Cyprus, which is right there in the Mediterranean sitting off the coast. And they had just this burning desire in their hearts to give Jesus to someone. They did not go to seminary. They didn't have Bible class. They didn't have any books. They didn't have anything. All that they had was a changed heart and a changed life that they wanted to give to somebody else. Do you know where I'm going now? Do you know what I'm about to say? You do not have to be trained. You do not have to read all the books. You do not have to know Hebrew and Greek like I do. The calling of a pastor is much different than the calling upon your life. All you have to give someone is what God has done in your life. But their desire was burning so hot that they left their homes, comfortable homes in North Africa, comfortable homes in Cyprus, which is a very beautiful island. Abraham, thank you for the pictures. He just got back from Cyprus. If you want to see pictures, go see Abraham after service. He'll show you the island. He'll show you the churches. Beautiful place. They left those places. And they went to Antioch in order to give Jesus to this massive city, and they were just ordinary people, unskilled, untrained, but a burning desire to give Christ to someone. But let me take you underneath that, because if all I say to you this morning, and, all, and if all that you hear is, well, I got to go talk to somebody about Jesus, then we missed a point, and I failed you as a pastor. What is really happening here is this. Pay close attention, church. Every time that God brings someone into your life, Every time that you begin a conversation about Jesus or maybe, hey, do you want to come to church or, what, you know, God is doing this and, hey, do you pray? Can I? Whenever you have some of those conversations that begin, it's not so much that you're going to give Jesus to someone for salvation. Amen. That is important. We must do that. But what is happening underneath is that as you share Jesus with this individual, as you slowly inch them a foot at a time, an inch at a time closer to Jesus, you are destroying the work of the devil in their lives. You are destroying and dismantling what the devil has been building in their lives for a lifetime. That is what is happening when you begin to give Jesus to someone. you got to look beyond just, well, let me just invite them to church, or let me just talk to them about Jesus, or let me just give them a testimony. All things that are right and true, as I've just said to you. But I want you to understand what's happening underneath that. Because even though you might say, well, so-and-so in my life, my gosh, they're, the, they're such sweet people and they have such nice kids and they haven't gotten in trouble and they don't hurt anybody and they don't, they don't curse or say bad words and they don't steal. Yes, that's fine and all well and good, but there's just two sides on the fence and they're on the wrong side of the fence. So it doesn't matter how nice they are. By default, they are lost and they are on their way to eternal hell and separation from God because devil has been building that into their the structure of their lives their opinions their perspectives how they see the world how they see family it might be all nice and well and good but it's not coming from God it's not coming from his word it's not coming through Christ therefore when you share someone with Jesus with someone on this level I just want you to understand that what you're really doing underneath here is that you are dismantling and destroying everything that the devil has built in their lives for a lifetime that is why what these people did, unknowns, is so critical and so important. I'm going to tell you about Antioch in a moment. But that's why the scripture write, writes here, as they shared with the Greeks, who were coming from a very different person than the Jews coming out of the synagogue, it says that the hand of the Lord was with them. The honest, burning desire to give Jesus to someone, the honest, burning desire to be able to see how the devil is manipulating. And sometimes it's just autopilot. It's just autopilot. Nice people, a nice family, nice kids. They don't get in trouble. How respectful they are. They work hard. They pay their taxes. They're good employees. They're good bosses. And you're saying to yourself, but okay, aren't they just like one step away? Yes. But nonetheless, they are still playing for the devil's team. Belong they technically belong to him. And he has invested a lot in getting them to be distracted from the truth that you are trying to present. So when you give someone salvation, be aware that you're also destroying everything that the devil has done in their lives. And if these ordinary, unknown people that history has swallowed up, 
can do it, then I know that you can do it as well. Because the hand of the Lord is always with those who have a burning desire to give Jesus a someone. And now I hope that your desire would burn deeper and your commitment to save one of your friends will go, will go even more deeper than it is right now because you understand that it, the devil is pulling their strings whether they know it or not. And that's the beauty of what these individuals were doing. Regular people without training, without websites, and without Instagrams, and without guitars, and without pastors wearing skinny jeans. And they were just giving Jesus to these individuals. And notice that the scripture also says that they were turning to the Lord. That means they were turning away from something. From the old lives, and the old habits, and the old way of thinking, they were turning over to a new life in Christ, to a brand new start. And it is to God's glory that we do not know who these people are so that he alone will receive all the glory and praise for what was happening. So let's talk about Antioch for a second. Antioch at this point in history, just to give you some ideas, and I think we have some pictures that we'll, kinda, we'll just kind of very quickly show you. This is what, uh, what she would have looked like. This is obviously a drawing from the ruins that they have found. That big river you see running to, through there is the Orontes River coming out of the mountains. This city sits about 15 miles, give or take, from the Mediterranean. Big cosmopolitan hub, big mixture. I think we have some of the ruins there that we'll kind of show you. Here's uh, one of the temples in the city. I think we also have a street that we wanted to show you. Uh, there is one of the pictures. And then the last picture is of a, a small temple, and we'll just hang there for a second, right there. We'll stay there for a second. So Antioch is the third biggest city in the world. The third biggest one. Half a million people living tucked in right there by that river that you just saw. Again, melting pot of people, Roman, Greek, Arab, Jewish, Persians living there, famous for sports, just like Miami. It had chariot races. We have the Heat and the Dolphins. Hopefully they'll be better this year. Who knows? We'll see. We'll keep our fingers crossed for them. Um, but unfortunately, they were more known for their depravity. In other words, South Beach was more famous than the beauty of their city. Because what you're staring at right there is the temple of Daphne. Long story short, Daphne was a very beautiful woman. And the god Apollo supposedly cast his eye on her, comes to earth to find her and hunt her down. In order to hide from Apollos, Daphne becomes a bush. Right? This is ancient world, a laurel bush. They're all in that area. They would surround that temple. And then he couldn't find her. But what happens? You build a temple to Daphne and also to Apollo's pursuit of her, you have these amazing gardens all around it, and every single day and night, there are men paying money to the priests, who are all women, and they're all prostitutes, and they reenact the chase through the bushes until you find her, you grab her, and then there is pleasure afterwards. So this is what Antioch is known for. In fact, in the ancient world, there was a saying that the entire world said, the morals of Daphne. In other words, what happens in Antioch stays in Antioch. You've heard that before, right? That's translated. That's what that means. It stayed there. And that's what the city was known for. And it's into, and we'll just leave the picture there for a little bit, and it was into that darkness, into that darkness that the gospel comes. It was into the cosmopolitan melting pot where the gospel starts to bring people together. We'll talk about that in a second. Where all of a sudden Jesus begins to turn people towards himself and all of a sudden people stop visiting the temple at Daphne because they found something better than chasing each other around in the night like we do at South Beach and now on Brickle in order to find something to fill us for all of just one evening. Now people were finding something different there that would fill them up for a lifetime that was satisfying them completely. And it's all coming because a bunch of unknown, untrained, regular people with a burning desire to give Jesus to someone and to dismantle what the devil is doing in their lives began to share Jesus with this city. And it began to change. Um, many of you know I was a youth pastor for many, many years. And uh, I don't know if we have a picture of a campfire there. I think we do or not. Um, every year I would take uh, the youth groups that I was a leader of for many years at Central Press. In fact, we're always part of those groups. He's upstairs today. And uh, at the very end of those retreats, you always have the campfire time, right? That's kind of the way youth retreats always finish, with the campfire time. Uh, by that time, I was already kind of burned out, 
from doing everything, and I had spoken three or four or five times to the group in our little sessions and talked one-on-one -on -one with a bunch of students, and I would always send the group out with the volunteers to kind of get the campfire, campfire started and the whole s'mores thing, the chocolate and the marshmallows, all that stuff going on. I'm looking at my notes really quick, splashing water on my face. Okay, so this is what I'm going to say to finish off the retreat. But here's the thing. You're in the middle of the woods. This was Lithia, Florida, right by that 275 juncture heading to St. Pete in Tampa. There's a little Presby a Presbyterian campground there. And when you would step out of the lodge at night, it's pitch black. There are no lights out there. And so you had to take the two steps down from the lodge, hang a right. There's a little path over here about, eh, maybe like about 10, 15 yards. You turn into the forest, and it's pitch black. Except that when the campfire is burning, even though it's about 40 yards into the forest, you can still see the glow. And it didn't matter if I didn't have lights around me. I was on a certain path. And the more steps I took closer to that little campfire, then the glows began into the leaves and the trees. And finally, when I arrived, it's just full-on light. That is the process of a city. That is what we are supposed to be to this city, a campfire in the middle of the dark forest. And Jesus has to burn hotter and brighter in all of our lives that you would be that campfire in the life of another that they might not know Jesus, and they might not get the Bible yet, and they might not know what's going on, but that they would see you. They would see you in the middle of a dark forest called Miami. And that as you slowly share and you slowly invite, you're putting them on a path. You're putting them on solid ground. And every step they take towards you, every step they take towards us, things get brighter. I am the light of the world. So even though the forest is pitch black, and it's nighttime, nonetheless, the light of Christ burns bright. And that's what began to happen here in Antioch. One of the darkest places on earth at that time becomes known as the birthplace for missionary work. This is where Paul and Barnabas go out. This is where Paul grabs Luke and grabs Timothy and they go out. This city of darkness all of a sudden has this other side to it that becomes a side of blessing the entire world with the gospel. This becomes home base for Paul. He leaves Tarsus. He leaves home base. And this becomes headquarters for the apostle Paul. This is where, and you just read it, and we'll get to that at the very end of the message, this is where we are called Christians for the first time. It began there, in the darkest of places. This is where the greatest of the early church leaders through the year 400, now, after Christ, 400, people, and you might not know these names, I'm just going to rattle them off and feel free to Google them. They are amazing. People like Ignatius, Theophilus, Lucian, Chrysostom. Chrysostom is a giant. These men preached in a massive church in Antioch. The place of darkness became a place of light. And so now I ask you, church, as I do every about once, two or three times a year, do not give up on Miami. I know that this place is frustrating. I know that this place makes you angry. I understand that this place makes you want to pull your hair out. I mean, I was sharing on Friday night with some of the folks that were here. We had a prayer meeting, some of the leadership of the church for, for you all, right? I mean, this week started for me with obscenities being screamed at me and threats, right? Oh, thanks, Miami. I love to serve here. But don't give up on the place. Because God still has work to do here. And if you can take Antioch with no social media, with no books, with no building, with no nothing. And if you can take Antioch and turn it into a home base of the gospel, then I know that God is not done with this place yet. Not yet. And it falls on us. Again, I can't, we, right now we can't speak for any other church. We can only speak for ours. Where you and I would have established friendships and relationships that are true and meaningful, not just to give them Jesus. you got to love them as a person. And you bring Jesus along into that place of love and we're friends and we are sharing life. It can't be superficial. It can't be fake. It can't just be an agenda kind of thing. That's not how this works. But that you would share life. And slowly you begin to create, and I'll mention this again towards the end of the message, what Tim Keller, who passed away, for those of you who know, they had his memorial service this week, a giant, uh, one of our giants in our generation, he always talked about creating a tipping point 
in the community. Some of you have heard me say that in the past, but it's worth repeating here again. What does that mean? It just means that when enough Christians in a city are talking about Jesus, when enough Christians in the city are giving their stuff away to the poor, when enough Christians in the city are helping, like, you know, open the door for someone as they walk in into public. Don't like open it, walk in, and then it slams behind you kind of a thing. When enough Christians are walking out of, of Publix or CVS or Walgreens or Sedanos, right? And you're like, God bless you. Have a great day. When enough of that begins to happen, you create a tipping point in the city where the name of Jesus is resounding in every corner. And all of a sudden, people who might not know Jesus, people who are walking in darkness, let's talk about Christmas for a second, right? Isaiah, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And they start to see a fire burning and they start looking around and saying, okay, so why am I surrounded by Jesus? Right? There are no churches in my neighborhood. Ah, because now all of a sudden all the Christians are active. And the tragedy, the tragedy of not only our city but across the U.S. is that there is so little cooperation between the churches. And that is why sometimes cities go without really being impacted like Antioch was. And that is to our shame and to our tragedy. Very quick story, barely a story, but I have a meeting with a pastor tomorrow. Spent five years in North Carolina, came back to Miami, it's kind of his home. Launched a small little church. His thing really is, is uh, feeding folks, that's his thing. We want to talk about that tomorrow. He randomly calls me. He was meeting with another pastor who kind of knows me. Got a call on Friday. We're going to meet on Monday just to kind of listen and see what, what the whole ministry is about. First thing out of his mouth. First thing out of his mouth. What do you think it was? First thing out of his mouth was, what's going on in this place? Why don't pastors want to work together? Our tragedy. Our tragedy. And that's why you cannot get upset at the city, you can't, because it's, it's because of us, and it's because of the lack of cooperation. I'm not going to put you on the spot. I'll put pastors on the spot, because I'm one of the ones here in the city refuse to work together, refuse. And if they refuse to work together, then obviously churches will not cooperate to bring salvation. And check this out, to dismantle what the devil is building in this place. Can you see the larger picture? Can you see how it goes from small to large? Of course it can't be dismantled if pastors can cannot even sit down and talk, okay, how can we, you know, attack the city together for the sake of the gospel and people's lives? We're more interested in protecting buildings and protecting a group than we are seeing people changed and saved on the other side of their time done here. One of the amazing things that begins to happen in the the church at Antioch, before we head into point number two, is that the lines begin to be blurred. On, on the last night that Christ was on earth, if you go to the Gospel of John, after the moment at the table, he sits and he prays. And one of the things that he prays for is that his people would be one. And what starts to happen in Antioch is that now you have Jew from the synagogue, you have half-breed, you have people like Cornelius who knew about Judaism, and now you have these crazy Roman Greek people over here, and they are becoming one family. You are beginning to blur the lines between color, culture, and creed, and it is reflecting a body of Christ. And, and that always gets everyone's attention because the only one who can tear down walls, now we can just think of our culture for a second, where we are as a culture, the only one that can tear down walls is Jesus Christ. Our second point, that blurring of the lines, you know gossip travels fast, I don't have to tell you that, makes it down to Jerusalem in a hurry. And the word at Jerusalem is, hey, we don't know how to say this the right way, but there's just a bunch of people up there and they're all hanging out together. And at the church, they actually hug each other, and they shake hands, and they eat together. Of course, for the, the Jewish individual coming out of the Old Testament, this is like mind-blowing. It's just like, what are, what's happening up there? So think about what they've been through. They have a right to be worried. Persecution, thanks to Paul. 
scattered. The church is small now, not big anymore. Philip, dealing with Samaritans. Peter, walking into our leader, into a Gentile home. And now Antioch. People are hugging and shaking hands and they're going to like Arreta at Antioch together afterwards. What are we going to do? And so they're like, you know what, we got to check on this. Because we've got we to see, have we lost control of it? Is God doing something new? I mean, we want to keep the name of Jesus pure. Okay, so uh, who's going to We start looking around the room. Who's going to go? Who's going to go? And there he is, a little spotlight on this guy, Barnabas. Again, we've been talking about Barnabas for like the last three or four weeks. A, such an unsung hero. He was raised on Cyprus. He was what you call a Hellenistic Jew. He was more Greek than Jewish at this point. He knew Antioch, he knew the area, he knew the life, the lifestyle. Let's send him. It's funny how small little choices, right, when God is allowed to lead them, because this was done after much prayer and thought. They could have sent one of the rule keeper guys that would have shown up to Antioch and said, what's going on here? Everybody off to the other sides of the table, let's split up the church because you guys can't, you could have done that. But they sent this guy, because he was the guy who sold his house and gave it to the disciples. He was the guy, remember last week, for those of you who were here, he took Paul by the hand. The Greek there, like a little boy. And he took him and he brought Paul, of all people, to Peter. Peter's thinking, man, this guy's going to kill me too. And then they had to smuggle him out. This is, this is what Barnabas is doing. So you send the guy who's a bridge builder. You send the guy who has a big heart up there to see what on earth is going on. And now the biggest contribution that Barnabas makes to church history, to world history, is that he has to become a bridge, not between two people, but between two churches. Because now you're talking about the Jerusalem church is worried about what's happening up north, and now you have this church up north that is like, I wonder if they're going to like us or not, but we don't care. We got the Holy Spirit and we're going, and now you got to build a bridge, and that's what Barnabas begins to do. Look at what describes him. It says here in verse 25, in 23, when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done. Okay, so Barnabas comes in and he's wearing a certain pair of glasses. He wants to see what the grace of God is doing. And it reminds us of how we view people. How do we view them? Do we view them with a critical eye? Even though, oh, Jesus, thank you for loving me and accepting me, but I'm going to look at you with a critical eye. How do we view these people when Barnabas comes and he opens the door to the church and he sees all these people thrown into the melting pot, which is now the church at Antioch? He had two choices. He could have looked at it with his human eyes and said, whoa, this is like breaking, I, I don't know how many Old Testament rules right here and right now. Like we got a problem here, sound the alarm and send uh, back to Jerusalem some word. Or he could have looked at it and say, what is God doing here? And so my encouragement to you is today, let's pray that we would have the eyes of Barnabas. That we will look at people, whether they are mature in their faith, or whether they're still wiping, the, like prodigal son, little brother, wiping the mud off their lives and starting to take small little baby steps towards the light that is burning, right? What, eyes of God to see. Because what Barnabas sees, he doesn't see the cultures and the different people sitting together. What Barnabas sees is people who are becoming patient and loving and caring and kind and compassionate. The fruits of the Spirit are being born in them. And so he's wearing a pair of glasses that he sees them as God sees them. Listen, the next time that someone really frustrates you and someone makes you really angry and you thought, man, but I thought that they were more mature in their faith and I can't believe that as a Christian, they would do that. Just stop, pause, and put on the God glasses and say, Lord, help me to see X, Y, Z individual as you see them as a lost son or daughter coming home, as someone who has wiped the mud off of their lives, as someone who maybe has been distracted a little bit. But give me your eyes to see. Barnabas would have walked into this room and it would have been shocking. And yet he sees the grace of God at work. The Holy Spirit, notice how he's described. He was a good man, Full of the Holy Spirit and faith. That's what it takes. Constant repentance before the Lord. That I will be more like Jesus. The more that I repent and walk in faith before the Lord. That I become more like Christ. 
the more I am filled with the Holy Spirit, and the more I am filled with the Holy Spirit, the more I treat and love and see people as Christ does. It's not very complicated. Not very complicated. And that's what was happening with Barnabas here. But notice what he does. It's not just a love fest. It says here in verse 23 right above it, he encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord. When you have a city that is known for the temple of Daphne and everything that happens there day and night, he is saying, you know what? I am glad that God is working and I love what God is doing here. Hey, let me hold you accountable. Stay true to Jesus Christ. He's not banging on their head with a Bible. He's not yelling at them. He's not giving them attitudes like, hey, make sure that you love Jesus in everything that you are doing. Make sure that you are staying close to his word. Stay true to him. And it says that a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Church, be a bridge builder. Be a bridge builder. Be a Barnabas in the life of another. Last week I challenged you to be Barnabas in the life of another where you hold someone's hand and connect them to Christ or connect them to another Christian that that person might be impacted. And here today you're seeing Barnabas playing a whole different role where he is, he is taking and he is looking at a group of people that he could have been critical of, but instead he is seeing the work of God in them and he is glad and he is happy and he's holding them accountable. He's saying, hey, keep walking with the Lord. I know where you're coming from. I understand your past because he was from the area. He says, but let's remain true to the Lord and I'm going to help you walk that way. That's what someone who is full of Holy Spirit and faith, that's what they sound like. That's what they look like. We begin to close. It says here in verse 25, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So now the church is too big, right? What the unknowns had begun to create and launch. And now Barnabas comes in with word from Jerusalem. And he's encouraging and he's loving them. And he's leading and he's keeping them accountable. Now the group is gotten massive. We're, we're, it's almost like an effect of like the Jerusalem after Pentecost. Here it comes. It's happening in Antioch. But... What I love about this man is that he was aware of his limits. Barnabas had another choice. He could have said, you know what? Since I'm the guy from Jerusalem and I'm the believer here, I'm going to become the boss here. I'm going to be the pastor. And I'm going to make sure that everybody pays attention to me. And I'm going to get my name, right, into the New Testament and into the storybooks forever. But no, what does he do? He humbles himself and he goes to look for Saul. Because he needed someone who was tough and sharp and direct he needed someone who was compassionate, who was skilled, a leader, a mentor. So he steps out of the spotlight and he brings Saul into the spotlight. So the beauty of the church at Antioch is that its first building block is one of humility. Philippians 2, consider others better than yourselves, just like following the example of Christ. Church, let's remain humble. Let's lift others up. And they begin to work together. But now you might be asking, so what has Paul been doing this whole time? What has he been up to? Well, I'm glad you asked. Very interesting that when we last saw him last week for us, right, he goes to Jerusalem. He meets Peter, as we read in Galatians. He talks to James, the Lord's brother. He starts to preach among the folks there. And they want to kill him too. So what did we say last week? The Jerusalem church says, listen, now we've had enough of the fighting. We don't want no more of this persecution stuff. Get this guy on a boat and send him back home. So off goes Paul. Hang on to your hats for a second. Because when Barnabas goes to look for Saul in Tarsus, it's been, this is like in the movie, right? Nine years later. And so you're saying to yourself, what has this guy been doing for nine years in Tarsus? Ah, I'm glad you asked that question too. We only have a little snippet. I'm going to read it for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 24. The events that Paul mentions there, he does not mention them anywhere else in his letters. Nowhere else. So all the scholars agree that this is him giving us a little snapshot of what happened to him in nine years. Pay close attention. You might be surprised how God was preparing him for this big step in, in the ministry. It'll be, be, it's be here behind me. Here we go. Verse 23. We'll skip over 23. We'll start at 24. Because he's comparing himself to other leaders. Verse 24. Five times 
I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea, the Mediterranean. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. And that's just him summarizing it for us. Because none of these events we see anywhere else. So scholars say this is what must have happened to him nine years preaching in Tarsus. This is how God was getting him ready. And then we see in Philippians chapter 3 verse 8. I don't know if we have it for you, but I'll read it for you. Philippians chapter 3 verse 8. This is where we, we arrive at this statement. When he says, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Scholars think that after, during his time in Tarsus, not only was this man's life turned upside down, last week we talked about it, that when God prepares you to share with another or to change a part of your life or to step into ministry, he will crush you or crush an area of your life in order to prepare you. And that's what he was doing to Paul for nine years. I don't know if I would have been able to do it for nine years. I might have given up. But he doesn't. He stays the course. And then the summary is, I have lost all things. Scholars also believe that if he had a family, this is when he lost it. So this man now is alone. And he is prepared to pay any price that Jesus would be known. So if you take the three years that we talked about last, year, uh, last week, where he was convert, the conversion on the road to Damascus, he preaches there a little bit, he goes to Arabia, then Jerusalem, back to Tarsus, and now... 12 years of preparing him for this moment. That is why only fools rush into ministry. That is why you never rush into, let me give you Jesus right now, or yeah, I'm a pastor, I want to do this. You consider the cost. You think it carefully. And even in your own life, as you share with someone, if, if you notice that as you're giving Christ to someone, as we've talked about, salvation and dismantling and destroying what the devil has done, if you realize that there's an area of your life that used to belong to Satan or it was kind of a shade of gray and it's being collapsed on itself and being destroyed, now you understand why. Because God is preparing you. He is setting the stage that this person would see him more clearly through you. And if he has to destroy an area of your life and if he has to crush you, he will. Paul had to lose it all had to consider things garbage that he would then gain Christ and be able to give him away. We'll close with this here. Is there a, is there a special story behind your name? I wonder. If you talk to your parents, is there something special behind your name? Uh, I think I've shared this with you before. Uh, my name comes from the Apollo 11 mission to the moon. There was uh, Michael Collins, the pilot. There was Neil Armstrong. We all know him. Well, there was this other guy called Edwin Buzz Aldrin. That's where my name comes from. That's what dad named me after. You can thank him for that. Antioch was famous for nicknames. They loved to make fun of people. A lot like Miami again. And there was one time, and I don't know if we have a picture of him or not. I think we do, of uh, Emperor, uh, Emperor Claudius, I believe was his name. This emperor came to visit, Emperor Julian, sorry, comes to visit uh, Antioch. And these people were so crazy. Again, a lot like Miami here. They called him the goat. Not because he was the greatest of all time, not that goat, but because he looked like one with his little beard. Calling the emperor of the world, the Roman guy, a goat is dangerous. You don't do that, but they did. But I share that with you so that you would know this. They start seeing, thank you upstairs, they start seeing this group of really annoying people. And they're talking about this Jesus guy all the time. And they get together and they talk about his word and they sing some songs and then they go have lunch together. And so 
the city is observing this church which is growing and multiplying. And so they want to make fun of it. This name doesn't come from the church. They didn't sit around and have a focus group and say, well, what are we going to call ourselves? Because that way thing is not working. The way, it's just got, no. This is Antioch referring to them. And so they called them Christians. They took Greek, Christ, and they added a Latin ending, Iani, Christians belonging to Jesus. Let me tell you something about your name. The name that you carry around that's on your driver's license, on your birth certificate, that's your second name. Your second name. Your first name is Christian. Because if you tell me that you have surrendered your heart and your life to Jesus Christ, that he truly is your Lord and Savior, then that's your first name. That's def it should define you. So when people talk about you, they shouldn't say, oh, because they're so nice, and that's a good thing. They shouldn't say, oh, because they're such a good parent. That's a good thing. I'm glad they refer to you that way. Oh, they work so hard. That's a good thing. Oh, they're so forgiving. That's a good thing. But the first thing that they should say about you is, that guy's a Christian. Yeah, she's a Christian. That's what should define you. And you can imagine someone with the attitude of Paul, because he has a sense of humor too, him and Barnabas sitting around a small group, and you, you can imagine, you know, what one of the Cubans in Antioch coming in late, because we're always late, to the Bible study. He walks in, he sits down with his medianoche in his hands, and he goes, you're never going to guess what I just heard at La Carreta. What? He says, they're calling us Christians. And you can imagine Paul turning to Barnabas and smiling, saying, we got them. We got them. Because now they're paying attention. Now they know who we are. So we got them. He, got, he grabbed the city by the throat. And now they called them Christians. It was a nickname. They were putting us down. But we kept it. And it has defined us for all of these years. Church, make sure that when folks talk about you and the way that you define yourself, make sure that the name of Jesus, the name of Christ is somewhere in there. And if the church was founded on humility, then its first step was one of compassion. If it would have kept reading just two or three verses, you would have seen that a prophet shows up to Antioch. He predicts through the Lord's, uh, you know, kind of vision that there's going to be a, a huge famine in the area. There is a famine historically in the area. The church in Jerusalem uh, all of a sudden is in need. And you know what Paul and Barnabas did? They got a bunch of Greek people, again, who didn't know Abraham, Moses, the law, Mount Sinai, the wilderness, Joshua, promised land. They didn't know King Saul, King David, King Solomon. They didn't know about the kingdoms breaking in half. They didn't know about the Babylon. They didn't know anything. And they said to them, we need money for our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. And all of these Gentiles who knew nothing of the history of Israel, they emptied their pockets, put it in a bag, and they took it to help feed the poor in Jerusalem. The church was founded on humility, thanks to Barnabas, and then on compassion for their brothers and sisters. I pray that our church, that this church would always be defined first and foremost by a commitment to the gospel and to Jesus Christ, to the word of God, but that it would be known for its humility and for its compassion, just like this first church was known. I was thinking about how to finish the series, and I want to do it this way. I want to ask the folks upstairs if, if they can put Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 up on the screen for us, and for those at home as well. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Give them a second, there comes the computer. I thought there's no better way for us to finish this series through the beginning of Acts. Oh, we've only scratched the surface. We'll jump into it again next year. Then I think for us to echo the words of Paul, that they would be our words today. Can we do that, church? Are you okay with that? Can we do that? So, so let's just, uh, I'm going to turn around as well for those online. Sorry, I'm going to turn around. And I'm just going to start it for us. And you guys can just jump in, and, 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 and I want to hear you. So let's say it together. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Can you say amen to that? 
Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this journey through the book of Acts. We thank you that we've seen Peter and John on the world stage. We've seen Stephen and just mentioned Philip and Peter and what he did with Cornelius and now Saul who is slowly transitioning to Paul, Barnabas, the key role that he played. And we thank you that we have been able to just watch them almost like on a movie screen, on a TV screen. And we've also just walked with them through the streets of these different places, Damascus, Antioch, Jerusalem. I pray, Lord, that this declaration by Paul would be our declaration today. That the life that we live, we no longer live for us, but we live for our Savior who gave himself for us. May that define us. May we de be defined by humility and compassion and your truth. Use us, God, as burning fires in this city that those who are searching and seeking would see that glow in the middle of the darkness and wonder what's going on over there in that life, in that home, at that church, and that they would have an encounter with you. Use us, God, as instruments of change in the life of another, in the flow of this city. And as we share you and as we interact with others, May we create that great tipping point where the name of Jesus is resounding off every corner and wall of this city that we live in. Give us a new desire for it. Give us a new love for it. Give us your love for it. Give us your eyes to see it and the people in it as well. That like these untrained and unknown folks from Cyrene and Cyprus, we would come to this place, our Antioch, that you have called us to and bring your light and your truth and your gospel. Jesus, thank you. Use us in a mighty way at this moment in time here in this place and in this city. And may the light of Christ burn brightly here. May the name of Christ be heard loudly here. And may you use us as those instruments of transformation in lives, and again, and in the life of this city. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for first loving us and for dying for us. We pray all this name in your precious name. Amen and amen. Well, church, once again, um, God bless you, and thank you so much for being with us here today. For those online, we welcome you in. As you can see on our screens here in church and at home, this is the moment where we respond to God's goodness in our lives by the giving of our tithes and of our offerings. Uh, if you're visiting, thank you for being with, with us. Would you take a moment to fill out those communication cards at the edges of, of the pew? We would love to stay in touch with you. Just give us your email, and we'll add you to that newsletter list, as you can see on your screens at home and also here in the church. If you want a text to give, you can do so in that fashion. And in just a moment, when you hear the music come over us, uh, you'll be able to come to either side of our stage and deposit your morning offering. Having said that, uh, we will now collect those tithes and offerings. A church, just a few announcements before we send you on your way. Uh, remember, use social media to connect someone to our church. It's a wonderful tool. Use those platforms to connect someone here to the life of our church that they would get to know us before they get to worship with us and in that way become familiar with how uh, we kind of uh, live as a family of faith. So take advantage of those uh, church. They're there for you. Um, at this point, we remind you, kickoff weekend is next week. Uh, invite someone to church. 
Uh, parents, uh, we start youth group on Friday night. If you want to connect someone to our church via the youth ministry, we'll be here on Friday night. We're bringing the rock wall out for the kids. We're bringing that joust thing for the kids, a bouncy for the little ones. So we have RC kids for the young ones. We have youth group for the older ones. We're going to have some pizza. It's going to be a great time. Connect someone to the youth group. On Saturday, we invite all of you to come. There's a sign-up sheet outside. We're going to be packing those packets that they sent overseas. Uh, please come out. It's a wonderful experience. Really fun kind of being just hanging out with somebody next, next to you just talking. Uh, we're going to try to pack 10,000 of those next Saturday. If you want to connect someone to the church via a service project, well, here you have the opportunity. And then, again, like I've been saying the last couple of weeks, if they just want to eat uh, Elias's barbecue, which everyone loves to do that, uh, bring them on Sunday. And we're going to have some burgers and hot dogs and whatever else he thinks of. He always comes up with something new. Uh, and bring them to service on Sunday at 1030. We're going to have a little baptism of some young ones as well. So it's going to be a very special Sunday for that. And then we'll eat together after church. Um, and uh, just, again, a Sunday to connect someone to Life of Our Ministry. Because on the other side of that, all of our activities begin. For the ladies out there, uh, we know it's a long weekend, but we want to launch you all with a breakfast on that Saturday, September 2nd. So if you are in town... Please uh, sign up in the, in the lobby out there so we know about the potluck and what we can bring. Uh, ladies, just separate an hour of your time. It's just really a kind of get things started uh, morning, not one of the long regular breakfasts. And then on the other side of that, you'll start your Zoom study that Tuesday, I believe September 5th. For the folks on the Spanish side of the church, also their Zoom study starts on the other side of kickoff weekend on that Thursday, 8 o'clock at night, uh, to jump on in for that for the ladies on the Spanish side. And then I think at this point we're good with the announcements upstairs, correct? I'm getting the thumbs up. Yes, I am. Let's stand together, church. You can hold hands with whoever you came with, and let me dismiss us with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great gift of Jesus. We thank you for giving us your most precious treasure, an indescribable name that is so profound and beautiful that it pours mercy and grace and power upon us every day. Holy Spirit, work in us, work in our church. Help us to burn hot and burn bright that people might see you and might hear you through us and have their destinies changed. Give us, God, your eyes and your heart for this place, for this city. Help us to look at it and see it as you do. And Father, as next weekend approaches, we lift it up to you right now that some of our friends, maybe family members will be coming, that they would hear the gospel, that they would connect, Lord, to you, not to us, to you, Lord, and begin to have their eyes open to the beauty, the beauty of the destiny and walk and life that you have for them, that they would be satisfied once and for all. So Heavenly Father, powerful God, we pray that you would do more here. Do more. Change us more. Bring others that would know you and engage Jesus Christ and encounter him and be saved, that their lives would be forever altered. So Holy Spirit, we're open. Mind, heart, soul, open to your work. Work in us and change us. We love you, Lord. We thank you for Jesus. In his precious name we all pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a wonderful week. For those online, God bless you. Yeah. Uh -huh.